today's sermon by sharing a story of an imaginary church not too dissimilar from Hillside. In this church, all are welcomed, and so it didn't strike the pastor as too unusual when one Sunday he spotted a new face he had never seen before. An unfamiliar man had joined the congregation, and the pastor couldn't help but notice that all throughout the services, throughout every prayer and every hymn, the man seemed to be quietly talking to himself. He didn't rise when the congregation rose. He didn't seem to be on the correct pages of the prayer book. In fact, he never opened it, and he didn't look up from his folded hands even once. The pastor was puzzled, but the man wasn't bothering anyone, so he let him be. The next week, the man was back. As before, he sat in the very last row of the pews, and all throughout the services seemed to be quietly speaking to himself, entirely out of sync with the services taking place around him. He was back the next week and the week after that, always in the back, always quietly talking to himself. By this point, the pastor's curiosity was too much. During a service led by a visiting guest pastor, he finally had the opportunity to see what might be going on. He sat in the back near the unfamiliar man and listened. He realized that all throughout the services, the man was quietly chanting, A, B, C, D, all the letters of the alphabet, over and over and over. They were the only words he spoke. At the end of the services, the pastor approached him and said, excuse me, I couldn't help but notice that you've been attending our services and we're very happy to have you, but I'm curious, why do you only come and recite the alphabet? And the man laughed and said, oh, well, that's because I don't know the words to any of the prayers or hymns, but I figure if I give God the alphabet, he'll put it in the right order for me. <laughs> I love this story starting with the message we can glean right off its surface. A message of acceptance, that imperfect prayer is still sacred, that God hears the words of our heart much more clearly than the words of our mouths, and that earnestly doing our best with what we have is enough. But I want to dig a little deeper. This story beautifully demonstrates how to pray with words when we don't know the words. But how do we sing with joy when we don't feel joy? Psalm 95 calls upon us to greet God's presence with gratitude and joyous sounds and to sing songs of praise. And there are plenty of days where that feeling is easy to access, days where it radiates effortlessly out of us, and our joy is not just obvious but contagious. Maybe the weather's particularly good, or things are going really well at work or at school or at home, or someone did us an unexpected kindness, or maybe we just really woke up on the right side of the bed that day. Gratitude check, joy sounds check, easy. But there's also plenty of days where that feeling of joy seems impossibly far away. There are days of frustration at all the petty nonsense that seems specifically designed to make our day in particular a living nightmare. This is how I feel when I call those customer service lines and I take an hour waiting to talk to a person and I get a person and they're like, I'm so sorry, you need another department? You should have pressed four at that intersection, and you wait another hour to actually talk to a person. Those are not days when I'm feeling grateful. But then there are bigger days, days of outrage at the countless injustices of the world, days of sorrow at the suffering that seems to headline every newspaper, and days of grief for all the personal sufferings that we each carry silently in our hearts, days of regret for harsh words or actions we wish we could undo, Days of fear when environmental and financial and political disaster seems yet again just around the corner. Days of overwhelm when everything around us seems too vast and too powerful for one person to possibly make a difference. It's no surprise that there are so many psalms of lament because there's a lot to lament about. So how are we supposed to sing with joy and thanksgiving on days like these? How are we supposed to sing with joy when we feel so heavy with sadness and everything else? Sadness is the opposite of joy, right? We have a pretty wise answer from a pretty unlikely source, Disney Pixar. In the 2015 film Inside Out, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it's been eight years, I think it's fair game. The story follows a young girl named Riley and the personified emotions inside her. Joy, sadness, disgust, anger, and fear all take turns at the control panel in her mind, influencing her thoughts expressing themselves through her words and actions, and coloring her memories. They are only able to take turns one by one. 
If sadness is in control, for instance, no other emotion can be expressed. When the story begins, Joy is in charge for most days, and she is the primary emotion for most of Riley's memories by an incredibly wide margin. After a series of dramatic life changes, the emotion of sadness begins to take over despite the other emotions' attempts to stop her. Soon Riley is bursting into tears at school, distancing herself from her friends and family, and abandoning her most beloved hobbies. The character of Joy tries to ignore sadness, or distract her, or override her control, or in her most dramatic attempt, trap her in an abyss of forgotten memories forever. I don't know about all of you, but that's not dissimilar to how I've tried to deal with my sadness sometimes. We all want to be happy, and sadness can feel like an unpleasant, burdensome, or even painful obstacle to our joy. How are we supposed to sing with joy when we have so much sadness getting in the way? But the story of Inside Out doesn't end with sadness being successfully banished to the deepest, darkest reaches of Riley's mind. It ends with the other emotions recognizing the vital role that sadness plays and how she is necessary for the experience of joy. By the climax of the movie, Riley's emotions have driven her to drastic measures in an attempt to solve her problems, but it only makes things worse and worse. At their wit's end, the other emotions finally relent and give sadness full and un unrestricted control of Riley. And it's only then, once sadness is allowed to take over, that we see true resolution. Riley finally breaks down, tearfully opening up to her parents about all the pain and all the grief that she's been carrying alone. And after this, finally, Riley is able to get the comfort she so sorely needed. In this moment, her emotions work together to create a new type of memory, one colored by a mixture of emotions felt at once, bittersweet with both the sadness of loss and the joy of being understood and loved at the same time. Riley's mind and the control panel that her emotions use is radically transformed. Before, only one emotion could express itself at once, but now all of them can express themselves together at the same time blending and ebbing and flowing to create richer and more complex emotions. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we're almost always feeling a whole bundle of emotions as at once. We might feel both fear and joy experienced as nervous excitement, both anger and disgust experiences outrage, both sadness and love experiences nostalgia, and many more. These are the complicated and messy emotions of a truly authentic human experience. All of these emotions are true, even when they're a jumbled mess, even when they're contradictory. This is especially the case for sadness and joy. As was beautifully said by poet Khalil Gibran, your joy is your sorrow unmasked, and the selfsame well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. Is not the cup that holds your wine the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven? Is not the lute that soothes your spirit the very wood that was hollowed with knives? When you are sorrowful, look again in your heart, and you shall see that, the truth, that in truth you are weeping for that which has been your delight. Just as faith is not the absence of doubt, and courage is not the absence of fear, joy is not the absence of sadness, and sadness is not the absence of joy. They are two sides of the same coin, each equally fundamental to the existence of other, and each equally sacred in the eyes of God. Psalm 95 speaks very clearly to this harmonious duality. It reads, in his, in his hands are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains, or in his hands are the depths of sadness and the heights of joy. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. Or, his, our tears are his, for he made them, and our smiling faces which his hands have formed. Our joy and our sadness are both sacred, and they are both inseparable from each other. So how do we sing with joy when we don't feel joy? We sing with sadness. Just as God can hear the prayers of our heart even when our words are a jumbled mess of disorganized letters, God can hear our joy even when our emotions are a disorganized mess of sadness and frustration and pain and worry and everything else. 
When we are in a place of sadness, we do not arrive at joy by ignoring that sadness or wishing it away or just kind of trying to scoot around it and not look at it directly. When we are in a place of sadness, we arrive at joy by first being sad. Truly acknowledging, naming, and feeling our sadness both rallies our joy by calling our support system and our community and our loved ones to our side, signaling to them that we need comfort. And sadness reveals the truth of our joy by showing us what is truly important and joyful to us. Joy is our sorrow unmasked. When we say, I'm sad because it's raining, we're actually saying, sunshine brings me joy, and maybe can please someone lend me an umbrella. When we say, I'm sad because I miss my grandfather, we're actually saying my relationship with him brought me so much joy, and maybe I'd like to reminisce with my family for a bit. When we say, I'm sad because I'm lonely, we're actually saying genuine, heartfelt human connection brings me so much joy, and I need my community to help remind me how loved I truly am. When we sing to God, my heart is full of sorrow, we're actually saying my heart is full of love for the people and places and experience that I most deeply cherish, even if I'm not among them right now. Joy is our sorrow unmasked. So listen to your sorrow and the wisdom it can reveal to you and honor your sorrow as the sacred and necessary emotion that it is. Anytime you are singing with sorrow, know that God can hear you singing with joy. Amen.